Everyone standing. Everyone standing. I want to give you a text that the Lord has dropped in my spirit for today. And I want to... Open up my heart in hopes that you'll capture the importance of vision and the importance of faith. In Genesis 12 and 1, we read, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. Watch this and you shall be a blessing now i'm sure everybody could say man if you want to be blessed but what we really want is to be a blessing if if i can get anything in your heart today the blessings of the lord only open up more opportunities for us to be a blessing i just desire to be a blessing how about you Hebrews 11, 8 says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called out to go to the place which he would receive an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Faith makes you go where you don't know where you're going. Come on now. Right now, before I tell you what I'm going to be preaching, I think we ought to erupt in a big thank you praise to Jesus for all he has done. If he's been good to you, come on and praise him. Well, that was an okay praise, but we're not in an okay church. And we haven't been saved by okay blood. I think we ought to give the Lord. Some say, I ain't shouted yet. Well, it's time to get on board, baby. The train is leaving. It's time to shout victory to the Lord. If you are so glad he's been good to you, let's shout a praise and give the Lord an awesome lighthouse praise. Yeah. Now, if for some reason, before you're seated, if for some reason, you did not pick up your pledge card. If you'll raise your hand, Barbie will serve you. If you did not get one, we want everyone to have one of these beautiful envelopes, please. All right, please raise your hand for that. Today I'll be preaching about the commitment of vision, and it's building the bridge as you walk on it. Lift your hands to the Lord. Now, God, I thank you for a great anointing in this place. I thank you, Lord, that you're going to do amazing things. I thank you, Lord, that right here, right now, we're going to see breakthrough power. Right here, right now, we're going to see miracles, signs, and wonders. You are going to touch your people, and we are going to just so fall in love with you like we never had before. We give because we love you, Lord. It's a joy to be a part of your great family. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, before you're seated, turn to someone and say, cross the bridge. As you're seated this morning, I want to just tell you that a few weeks ago, we launched into this path. It's called the, vis the, the reality path. It's a critical path. It's from vision to reality. If you notice this bridge, I'm sure the guys can get you a good picture of it. There are some slats missing. Today, we're going to build the bridge based on our vision. I want to read some things to you that I wrote. I've been doing this um, the past couple weeks as I have opportunity. These are things that I wrote down as a young pastor. I wrote these down when I was 28 years old, and now I'm 58 for a couple more days. Amen, somebody. It gets better. Number one, I wrote a place of growth. That's about faithfulness and boldness, where there is a vision. Listen, I just wrote this a long, long, long time ago, and I've been standing on these 15 points for all the ministry. I'm not reading all 15. I'm picking out four. Where there's a vision and passion to see as many people won and discipled as possible. One of the greatest compliments I ever get is somebody that moved away, oh, 20 years ago, and come back and says, Pastor, you're as on fire today as you was way back then. I'm, I made the decision, I'm never going to let the fire go out. I'm never going to lose passion. I'm going to be passionate for Jesus. We're going to be passionate for him. A church 
A church that we pray, Lord, enlarge our territories. A church where it's not all about us. And it's easy for the church to do that, make it about us. A place where there is a sincere and consistent effort to reach out and to not be satisfied with where we are, to be the strongest, most well-balanced Pentecostal church in our region. I wrote 30 years ago a place of multiculturalism. The Richmond area, like most places in America, is a melting pot for a variety of races and cultures. As society changes, the church must change to be, be prepared to meet its needs. I desire to be Richmond's, I desire to be Richmond's multicultural church where people of, of God worship side by side with no thought of racial differences where bias and prejudice is never welcome and people are free to celebrate the only color that matters, red, for the precious blood of Jesus. <laughs> things I'm talking about are not new. They're not a hobby horse. A place of the Word, I call that personal growth, where the preaching is delivered with power and anointing. Where the preaching is delivered with power and anointing. Where the messages are uncompromising. I'm sorry, I'm still working on that one. Challenging, encouraging, and relevant. A place where the Bible is taught in such a way that practical application is made easy. How are we doing on that? And I wrote 30 years ago, here's what I said, a place of financial breakthrough. Listen to it. Where the church is blessed financially so that the ministry can flourish unhindered. Where there is no lack, need, or want. Where each family of the church is blessed... Is that you? Here's my prayer for you. Where each family of the church is blessed with financial security, with jobs they are fulfilled in, and where their needs are met. A place where people can learn God's principles of stewardship and prosperity. How am we doing? Where debt is being attacked and the entire congregation is free from poverty and extreme pressure. Can you agree with me on that one? Come on now. I said, can you agree with me about that? We want to see you free from pressure. I've got a question for you. What happens if you let God get in your vision? What would really happen is if you said, God, you've given me this vision. You see, all I did was I sat down all those years ago, and I just said, this is what I want our church to look like. A vision is saying, God, this is what I want my life to look like. If you are in a certain spot and you don't want your life being there, you have to have a vision to get out of it. Let me tell you something. I'm a visionary. I am a tomorrow thinker. I am never okay with not having progress. I am never fine with just sitting still. I want the people of God. I want Lighthouse, and I want our lives and my family and my marriage and in every area of my life to go forward and only forward. And so we cannot sit still. Four years ago, we launched into a 2020 vision. What do we want our church to look like four years from now? As we get nearer to the year 2020, 2020 in um, the I world is perfect vision. And we wanted to crystallize the vision that God has given us. So we launched into this 2020 vision. And today we are taking a critical step in the fulfillment of that vision. Here's the thing about building a bridge as you walk on it. It requires faith, it requires courage, it requires confidence, and it requires commitment. So if you're ready, can I build this bridge today? Because in a few moments, in a few moments, all of you are gonna walk on this bridge. And because I love you, I'm going to fill in the middle. I'm not going to let you fall down into the crocodile-infested waters beneath. What we said a few weeks ago was we are going to, first of all, build a church, build the bridge to our vision, and it's going to require faithfulness and boldness. What this means is that you are going to share your faith. It would be difficult <clears throat> to think about 
for some of you, when the last time was I shared my faith with somebody in the world? When's the last time I invited somebody to my church? When was the last time I was bold? When was the last time I had the courage to walk up somebody I care about and say, I care about the condition of your eternal soul. Jesus is coming soon, and it's time, listen, it's time that the church get out of the closet. We've got to be bold and courageous, and we also got to be faithful. It is, it is paramount that we are faithful to the work of God, to the giving of God, to the house of God, to the Word of God, to our time in prayer, we have got to be faithful. You don't think faithfulness is a premium to God? Here's the words you're going to say. hear Him say, hopefully, when you get to heaven. Well done, good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. I know some of you are talented, but He's not impressed with your talent. I know some of you are good looking. Well, let me phrase that. All of you are really good looking. But he is not impressed with your good looks. All of you are gifted, but he is not. The only thing that God is moved by is faithfulness. I've got a couple experienced professionals that are going to help us put this plank in. Come on, guys. See if they can line it up and make it square. I bet they can. All right. Secondly, I mentioned a moment ago, multiculturalism as I said as I said a few um, wait a minute I can't resist <laughs> you gotta watch you gotta watch pastor get a pat on his hand listen I have friends just, just a little ways from here that their church is just filled with all kinds of folks from all kinds of places and the reality is if you want to worship only with the people of your own color, you probably should think of an alternative rather than heaven. Let me read Revelation 5 and 9 to you. And they sang a song, and they said, You're worthy to take the scroll and open the seals, for you were slain, and you have redeemed them by your own blood. Who sang the song? People out of every tribe and tongue, and people, and nation. Everybody. So today, when you worshiped, you worship like heaven's worshiping. Because we look around this church, and we're getting there. We're getting better. We're working on it. We're very uh, sincere about it. But we want to say to, we just want to say to everybody that Richmond has a church where it's just not all one color. It's just not all one background. We have a church where people can come and they can be loved. They can be, you know, they can just experience just so much acceptance and they can know that they are cared about. The skin color does not matter. Somebody give the Lord a praise about that. Break time's over. Man, they was taking a break. Personal growth. The third plank that we said we would focus on in seeing that our vision becomes reality is getting you to live for the Lord Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Well, skip, skip Saturday because Saturday you can sin a little bit. And back in on Sunday. No. Every day of your life, every hour of the day, you are a Christian. And praising God and worshiping God and reading your Bible and praying and seeking God's face in your secret place has to be the most important time of your day. You got to wake up in the morning and Jesus has got to be on your lips. You got to wake up in the morning and Jesus has got to be on your hearts. You got to wake up, the first thing is begin to seek God's face and open your word and begin to get close to the Lord. It's called personal growth. It's witnessing, it's fellowshipping, it's coming to God's house faithfully, it's tithing and it's giving, and it's all the things that people do when they grow. Let me tell you something if you don't grow, you're dying. Raise your hand if you ever know anyone that backslid. Raise your hand if you ever backslid. Raise your hand if you didn't raise your hand. Now watch this. 
I have never met one person that didn't slip away from the Lord that it didn't start here. They skipped a day of prayer. Then they skipped a couple other days of prayer. Then they got out of their word. And then, and I've, I've talked to hundreds of backsliders, and I said, when did you stop reading? I didn't say, did you stop reading the Bible, or did you stop praying? When did you? Because, listen to me, you cannot backslide if you stay closer to Jesus. Church, listen to me, you cannot get your eyes off of Jesus even a little bit. Even a little bit. You've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. You've got to love Jesus more today than you did yesterday, but not as much as tomorrow. Are you growing personally? We said a few weeks ago, we passed out the grade cards, and our church had about 60% that are hitting an average of an A or a B. 40% were a C or lower, and that is not good enough. My urge to you today is to get you to grow and to draw closer to Jesus than you've ever been. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. (laughs) And today we're going to spend a few moments on the final thing because it's important. The lifting of finances. What we have in our church is a group of very wonderful, generous people. You are some of the most caring, loving, and giving people that anyone have the joy of pastoring. You say, why do you stay at the same church for 30 years? Because I couldn't find a better one to go to. Can you guys drill quietly over there? And uh, we... You guys are awesome. Look at that. You got the words right? Listen, people say, well, where's the pressure? It's because that we've got to move. And I want to ask you this. In your own personal life, how many of you ever, this is a crazy question, but I'm just looking for all those liars who refuse to raise their hands. Hallelujah. And I'm going to come and get your candy bar back if you have it. How many still have your candy bar? Okay, let's be honest. How many have already ate yours? You bunch of P.I.G. hogs. We have any extra candy bars left? We have a lot left? Oh, Chris and Mary. Where's the, okay, I might give some extras. We have any extra? Who has the extra candy bars? Chris, you hide them under your feet right there? Okay, we're going to get Here's the thing. How many of you have ever been under financial pressure? Is it fun? Is it dreadful? Is it horrible? Is it no way you want to keep living? I've discovered that people who are living free from financial pressure, that's how they want their church to live. But people that are under financial pressure Since they're under financial pressure, why shouldn't the church be under financial pressure? So when we talk about finances, I want to make this statement. Um, God said that he would supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19 goes on record, if you'll take care of me, I'll take care of your needs. And I'll put you in a place where you are above and not beneath. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your finances, when people talk about money, talk about finances, they think about their wallet. But listen, the question is, when it comes to money, not what's in your wallet, but what's in your heart. Because Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 21, wherever your treasure is, there your heart is also. So when we love the Lord, watch this, giving to God is a very natural thing. You know, we have in our city, I was talking to, Uh, a police officer, and I just said, is the drug problem getting any better? And the answer is yes and no. Heroin is going down, but the use of meth is going up because people have decided they should probably try to do something that doesn't kill them first time. But they're still trying to catch a high. Well, listen, I'm going to tell you something. 
You're looking at a guy. I got a confession to make. I got a serious, serious problem. But you knew that. I live my life on a buzz. I am high all the time. And I know not everybody sees it this way, but one of the greatest joys of my life, the thing that makes me high, is I can give generously to God's work. It is it is like a high. I just walk around like a buzz, man. Okay, that was bad. <laughs> but I am, so, I am so in love with the Lord that giving to Him thrills me. It absolutely lights me up. I mean, it starts my life on fire. The fact that I get to give to eternal purposes. Listen, I would rather I, I would rather be rich in God's glory than rich in the world and bankrupt in heaven. Hallelujah. I don't have a lot of money in this bank, but I got a lot of investment in his bank. And I would rather any day of the week, I would rather trust my finances with heaven than I would a man. My, I got one rich aunt, and trust me, uh, I had two rich aunts. The first one cut me out of her will because I was a preacher, and the next one already told me, uh, I've got 12 nieces and nephews, and I'm giving it to two, and you ain't one of them. So praise God for that. But I want you to do my funeral. Yeah, I'm going to do your funeral. I'm, i got something to say. <clears throat> but she told me, she said, she said, on one day, she got all kinds of money. She said, on one day, a few years ago, when the stock market dropped, she said, I lost $75,000 in one day. Listen, we trust, we trust our money more to men than we do with God. And we can lay up treasures in heaven. Listen, money is not about what is in your wallet, but it is about what's in your heart. I was listening to Dave Ramsey just Friday, I think, Thursday or Friday. <coughs> He made this statement. He says, you know, because they do these financial peace universities. We've done them here. Um, incidentally, we got a surprise for you in a few weeks. But, but incidentally, um, he said, why don't people go and learn about budgeting? Why don't people go and figure out how to do their finances? Because let me tell you something, church. I want you, everybody to hear me. I want you to be poor for your last day. Shout with me. I've had my last day of poverty. You say, well, Pastor, I can say that, but I don't have any money. No, poverty is not about what's in your wallet. It's about how you think. It's a mentality. It's looking at life through the lens of, I never have enough. I never will have enough. I'll never, I'll never get ahead. I'll never pay my bills on time. I'll never, never, never. It's somebody else. Somebody else has a silver spoon. Somebody else gets all the luck. Somebody else. It's not, it's not in the cards for me. No, that's poverty. Let the poor say, I am rich. Woo, come on, somebody. I read that somewhere. And I was reading and hearing, and he said, here is why. Here's two reasons. Here's two reasons. I can put this quote up there. People don't want to talk about finances, guilt, and shame. So today, I'm going to talk about guilt and shame for a moment. There are people in here that you know that you'd love to be able to give to God. You'd love to be a faithful tither. You'd love to be an extravagant giver. But you have been, you just are not there yet. Or there are people here who's made some money mistakes. How many of you, again, I'm going to come get your candy bar back, and I may give you one just to take it back. But how many of you have ever been D-U-M-B with M-O-N-E-Y? That's done with money. You made some money mistakes. I mean, you know, you, you just did some things that you wish you hadn't. I mean, you just know that you ought to be a little farther off than you are. Come on, somebody. How many figured that at your age now, you'd be a little farther off than you are right now besides me, somebody? Come on. Now, here's the reality. Today is a day where that chain and that curse and that lie of the devil of shame and guilt is broken over you once and for all. You cannot do anything about yesterday, but you can sure stand up and do something today. You can say, Lord, I'm going to operate in faith. I'm going to operate in hearing your word. I'm going to be sensitive to you. And Lord, 
I am going to step out and stretch myself and do incredible and amazing things. Now, what your church has been blessed with is plenty of opportunities to keep things going. Now, we do not operate behind, but I will tell you this much. What we want to see happen in your giving today <coughs> is a financial lift where we can go from, from merely maintenance dollars to vision dollars. Come on now. And I want you to do the same thing. Begin to save up. You don't have to spend every, if you can put one quarter or one dollar a week in the bank, please don't just work your rear end off all week long to put it in a hole. Show something that you have worked for and you can look and say, well, I'll build it up to $40. I built it up to $500. I have an emergency fund of $1,000. Not am I only paying my bills and living, but I've got something in the savings for a rainy day because the rainy days are coming. You got to plan for the unplanned for. You got to expect the unexpected. Now, let me tell you something. Some of us, that's going to take a change of behavior. We got to make our dollars behave. We got to make our money work for us, not just we work for it. Money makes a great servant, but it makes a bad master. And we work our fingers to the bone, and we wind up with nothing but bony fingers. You say, well, I'm just trying. I'm in the rat race. Well, if you win the rat race, you know what that means? You're just number one rat. So today, I want to encourage you to give to your church faithfully. The reason we're asking for a two-year commitment, not, not everyone wants to make a pledge. We'll just put it in. We'll, we'll take cold, car, cold hard cash, whatever you want to do, but be faithful. I want to thank you for that from the bottom of my heart. But we're going to see financial restraints lifted. Listen, have you ever heard the old saying, you can't outgive God? I'm trying to. Okay, guys, put the last plank in. And I want to step on the bridge, and I want to show you guys, show this church exactly what's going to happen today. I remember that we fall in love with the Lord. We give to his work. We give to his work. Give me, you know, how many know really, how many know any really, uh, maybe how can I phrase this, uh, good drunks? I mean, they're committed to being a drunk. I mean, they, they're dedicated to it. I mean, they're just going to. You know, um, this is why I've always thought, mm, do we have to really fuss much about 10%? Should we really have to twist somebody's arm on that? Because when you were a drunk or when you were uh, going to the strip clubs or when you were playing the devil's game, you gave him a whole lot more than I want to tell you a story that I've told you many times. Some of you will hear it for the first time. But um, when I was 20 years old, I got my first mortgage. I was a homeowner at 20. I had a very good job. I worked my way through college. I was making great money, I, even way back in the early 80s. Uh, I just got put me in the right place at the right time. I tithed all my life. You know, I'd mow a yard. I'd get 20. I'd give God 10. I thought that was a tithe half. I, I gave 50%. Dad never told me it was just 10. I learned later, I said, Dad, I'm giving 10 out of 20. I, I found out I could get by with only two out, of, two out of 20. What's up with that? He said, but you're blessed, aren't you? So shut up. And uh, so I was blessed. Kathy and I got married. We moved into our little home that we owned. Back in 1980, we got a mortgage for 13% interest. And... Uh, wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth that. Can I tell you what? If it could fit on that platform, well, two of them could fit on that platform, two of our houses. But we are so proud of the house and car payment, etc. And I was working, and um, and I was okay. I was okay, but I knew I was missing God's call for my life. I knew that I should be a pastor. Um, and at 23 years of age, with one six-month-old baby boy. Um, Walked in one day to watch them put a note on this company that had been there 100 years and said, we are closing the doors. Now, 
it's going to be sounding mean for me to say this, but I believe God could have closed up a whole company just to get my attention. Those other guys so smart and talented, they had a job by 11 o'clock. They, 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 they didn't need that place. But the reality is I was lost. I didn't know what to do. Got a call. Hey, come to Princeton and help us this summer. You're off. Um, and we're building the stuff in the school. Help us, help us at the church. And so, listen, you've got a young man that's pretty prideful and pretty self-reliant, always has worked hard. And now, all of a sudden, I'm getting an unemployment check for $84 and I'm staying in my <clears throat> staying in my in-laws upstairs and I was just I was just lost I didn't know what I was going to do and so we, we was going to church. We was attending that church. And um, one night, the preacher says something about maybe, maybe God will lay on your heart to give $100. You've heard me tell this story. I may have never heard this story. And so the offering starts. And Kathy said to me, well, well, well what do you think? And I said, about what? She said, you think we should give $100? I said, you know, man of faith, passionate, on fire for the Lord. I said, absolutely not, no way. Do we even have $100? She lifted up the checkbook register, $100.24. What I'm saying to you, I was sitting right where Steve was on the second row that church I'm saying to you that day changed the course of my destiny if I would have been stubborn and thought about me and I would have said no no the church would be fine without that everything's going to be fine I, that's my money I, I'm not going to do that I'm going to I'm going to no we got to take care of us I don't know where I'd be today but the Lord got into my spirit, and I said to her, write the check. So she wrote that check, put it in an envelope, and you tie the envelope, please. And, I, and it's like some of you who, who give and plant and invest for the first time. It's like, <laughs> you just, uh, but you're building a bridge while you walk on. That's what's happening. Faith, faith, faith calls you to go out where you don't know where you're going. Faith doesn't give you all the, pro the projections. Faith doesn't give you all the logic. Faith doesn't tell you how it's all going to work out. Faith just says, go and you go. So it's been, <clears throat> that was in 1983, the fall. This fall, I am celebrating 35 years of full-time pastoral ministry right now. 35 years ago that happened. So fast forward 35 years. I say to Kathy, honey, this is what I feel the Lord wants us to do on this journey for the next two years. We're going to stretch. We're going to give a large percentage of our income every week to the work of the Lord. And we always do that, and we love to do that. That's why I don't like payments, because if I have all kinds of payments, credit cards out there, Visa's going to have to starve if they're waiting on me, because I don't have one. MasterCard, Sears, see what happened? J.C. Penney's, all those folks, I mean, you know, they're just not going to ever get an extra dime out of us. My point is, the reason I do that is because I want to give big to the work of the Lord. I get high on that. It gives me a great joy. So a week or two ago, she said to me, you know, we're giving a, a large what I felt would be a substantial stretching faith promise so she says to me I think we need to give 5,000 more so I had to go back to that pew as a young man when the Lord spoke to my wife and I said to her write the check I didn't fuss I didn't say 
yo, I'm the boss of this house. I'm the man. Submit to me, woman, old lady. No, I'm alive, right? You don't see a skillet on my head? What we've done for, we've, what we've been asking to do in the past four weeks, we've just been asking, would you pray and see God's face? Would you just ask the Lord what he'd have you do? And we trust that when he speaks to you, you will do it. How many have been on that journey with me? You've been seeking God's face. Would you give me a raise of hands on this house? So today, I know maybe some of you did not get here. Give, give me a faith. I got one. You, you may not have a faith promise card, but today, here's what we're going to do. We're just simply going to ask you to pray. We're going to cross this bridge together, and we're going to see God's face, and we're going to watch God do a miracle. Hallelujah.